Um, working with legacy and human systems and security. Um, I have a really strange background. Um, I started off a long time ago, as many of you as I imagine, uh, in terms of the internet, uh, playing with Prodigy. Um, since that time, I got a theater degree, um, and then I decided to join the military, go to forensic psychology, uh, and then I got involved in the intelligence world as well. And it's given me a interesting, strange background, and uh, I love talking about and thinking about human behavior and security as to not just how to get people to do things that you want them to do, but how to maybe course correct some. And that's what I'm hoping to talk a bit about today. Um, in terms of in terms of background, like I mentioned briefly, uh, probably circa 2004, I joined the military. Uh, got into the intelligence world specifically because no one was going to send me to college for an umpteenth time. Um, and I wanted to do that to get a clearance so that I could work against human trafficking at FBI. I figured that was my path there. Um, I did get to work in the intelligence world. I did get to do a lot of cool things for a while, uh, but I went more down the counterintelligence path, uh, which in that time was, was very interesting with the emergence of um, social media platforms um, and cyber angles to, uh, to uh, intelligence threats and, and the like. Um, I ended up becoming an insider threat senior official for, for a former company that I worked at. Uh, but I also always applied these behavioral mechanisms to everything I was doing. Uh, while I was also working in forensic psychology, one of the things that um, I kind of became uh, developed at was to, uh, to point back to one of the earlier uh, talk tracks today. If you saw Lee Dennis's uh, conversation on, on pretexting, that's exactly what I did. Um, I taught a course on, on leveraging OSINT and leveraging psychological principles uh, to help identify um, what might make someone want to talk, how to get to that second date, which was really the, the purpose of any um, spy work or um, social engineering, if you want to think about it. So um, taking all of that, I'm going to kind of step it backwards and say, um, here's, what, here's what I've seen and here's some thoughts that I kind of have around taking principles from forensic psychology evolutionary psychology and social engineering, and perhaps um, seeing how we can um, help help our organizations, because they all consist of people, um, um, modify or, or at least um, be victims <laughs> less often. So uh, first off, I'll just, I'll go right into a little bit of history around the humanity. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about what humans are good at and not so great at doing. Um, how we deal with that legacy equipment, that human brain 1.0 that's still in our environments, how we can build on what actually works, uh, and then we'll wrap it up hopefully with some Q&A time. So um, humans, been around for a long time, love them, uh, 3.7 million years. It's hard to believe that it's been that long. Uh, only 2 million years ago, we're starting to use our first tools. You know, depending on what you read out there, these, these dates are obviously not solid. It moves a little bit to the left and the right, but the point here is, you know, only 360,000 years ago, we're starting to see uh, first use of fire migrating out of Africa. Agricultural revolution, the ability for a society to really sustain beyond a tribe of 50 to 100 people uh, by planting and things like that. That was very recent. Um, people really have only got into this kind of mode that we're in now uh, very recently. 50,000 years. Um, okay, so 40,000 years ago, we're seeing uh, complex languages. Last ice age, 25,000 years ago. Agricultural revolution, as I already mentioned, 12,000 years ago. Writing, 3,000. Uh, when you think about that, what you know just happened in the last 10 years or uh, you know since 2001, um, which I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, the, the scale of the momentum is, is just uh, amazing. Uh, but when you look at how slowly things progressed in the past, um, it, I think it helps give some context to the world that the human brain uh, grew up in. Uh, and that leads me into a bit about what we're good at and we're not so good at. Um, well, last year on here, you know, we've been using the sun as our main fuel, fuel source forever. Now we're just getting back to it. All right, so the long and short of it is we've been camping for a really, really, really long time. Um, you, may, you may not love camping, uh, you may love it, but your brain is really good at it. Um, the, the human brain grew up in either a hunter-gatherer society of some sort for this long period of time, uh, up until we see this explosion boom after the agricultural revolution. Um, and so there's some thinking in evolutionary psychology about 
how the programs, and when I say programs in the human brain, um, if uh, presented a certain situation, how it reacts, right? And the thinking is that some of this is essentially hardwired in over thousands and thousands of years of evolution. Um, if you're familiar with the concept of natural selection, natural selection is a ethically blind process, and it tends to reproduce programs that are effective at adapting and solving a problem. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily the most correct. Um, there's, you know, some uh, classic examples around, you know, when you think you're looking at an object, it's actually a trick of uh, the way your brain is interpreting data and things like that. Uh, the human brain makes shortcuts all the time. We do this with all the time. Um, and so it's, it's resulted in the individuals that we are now, uh, the society that we are now, or <laughs> the brains that we are now. So the problem we're faced with, in short, is we have human brains from yesteryear of thousands of years that were hunting and gathering, living in very small groups of maybe upwards of 150 people, and uh, and now they are now they are you know running global operations with uh, you know fourth, fifth, and umpteenth degree order of effects whenever we make decisions. Um, and and how does the human brain of that year uh, process the world we live in today? So the good, the bad, and the ugly about humanity. We'll start with the good. Uh, my first and favorite thing here is theory of mind. Uh, theory of mind is an excellent capability uh, that humans and some other animals uh, appear to share. Uh, theory of mind is the ability, in short, to think about what another person is thinking about, to be able to make um, conjectures and conclusions and inferences about what a, another person who's maybe not communicating to you, what they're thinking. Now, why, why is it so essential that we have this capability? Theory of mind is essential because there's a problem that we've had all along in humanity, and that's jerks uh, or free riders. So if you think about what, it, what an organism wants to do. Um, every organism essentially wants to eat, sleep, and reproduce at some point. Uh, it wants to sustain its own organism. People are the same way, uh, and so we are sometimes prone to taking shortcuts to get things done. And these are sometimes called free riders, those who look to take advantage of a situation uh, and do the minimal amount of work and reap the most reward. Having theory of mind puts us theoretically, hopefully, less at the mercy of those individuals. Now, social engineering is going exactly after how we can attack uh, the elements around theory of mind and some of the pieces. Uh, we made some great comments about um, subconscious operations that are kind of comparing and contrasting certain situations about how an, an a, uh, individual is uh, reacting to us and what they're asking. Um, but in short, this is a really great mechanism um, that can get us at least, you know, beyond someone who's not um, super sophisticated. Um, the other piece of it, so aside from uh, identifying free riders, those people who are trying to, you know, get to eat the elephant without going on the hunt, uh, we're also really good at detecting violations of social exchange rules. So um, I was always horrible at logic rules. Uh, I'll be blunt, you know, P implies Q made no sense to me. Um, but Studies have shown that when people are provided a P implies Q in a social context um, rule, um, they identify violations of it almost all the time. I want to say it's upwards of 80%. So what I mean by that is, is in short, um, if you do the work, then you get paid. Uh, if you go on the hunt, you get to eat the prey. Uh, if you build the hut, you get to live in it. If you live in the hut, then you built it, right? Um, people are good at that. And even when there are cultural specific contextual rules uh, they found where somebody, let's say from, you know, Sheboygan uh, talks to uh, someone from the Amazon and they have their own kind of cultural if then rule, uh, the person from Sheboygan can still understand when that violation has occurred. Uh, there's some a downside to that and I'll get to that in a second. Identifying breaches of some safety rules. Now this is important. We're good at identifying breaches of safety rules of, as in, I'm not going to run off the cliff, uh, hence the lemming. Um, I'm going to, you know, be careful around fire or lightning. There's some ways that we just operate where we know that there are uh, environmental stressors and we know not to breach them. Um, the way I like to think about it is it really comes down to um, obvious threats to the existence of self 
and perhaps one's progeny, right? Uh, because we all live in these societies with, you know, all the, you know, the elders and the youth and kind of a more of a tribal arrangement, but um, identifying those threats to the existence of us as, as a whole. All right, so not so good, um, some bad things. Uh, if, if the violation of logic is in a non-social context, uh, so really anything, humans uh, identify violations of logic about 30% of the time. We're really bad at it. So why does that matter? Well, that has massive implications for anyone operating in an organization where there are if-then rules about how we process or we conduct ourselves that don't tie back to a social contextual understanding, right? Uh, we've all seen these security awareness trainings um, that talk about these like third order effects um, or these needs to follow a certain process. But um, if it's not, if it doesn't resonate with the individual at a very uh, organic level, um, we're not necessarily so good. We're not as focused on it as we are um, that blinking light on our cell phone uh, for all the social, that social uh, data that we constantly want to absorb and take in upper limits on relational agreements to consider. So um, when you have a brain and you steep it in a couple hundred thousand years of um, connections, of let's say maybe 50 people in a lifetime, maybe 150, um, that's kind of what it's good at. So when you take that brain and then you put it in a society today where you have, you know, a trans, transatlantic, transoceanic, um, virtual, um, muddled agree, muddled understandings about, you know, how the social dynamics work, uh, what is business, what is friendship, um, et cetera. Uh, these are all beyond essentially the, the buffer limit of, of the human brain. And we're not really good at handling all that data uh, as streamlined as we did with maybe 50 people. So similarly, th there's that correlates with a limited ability to consider second and third order threats, right? My favorite example of this is, you know, when we talk about protecting intellectual property, uh, when we tell people that we're doing security awareness, you're not going to click on links because country X will steal all of our stuff. And we're using this obscure them that, you know, I as an employee have never really encountered. How does that resonate? Does it resonate at all? So what if country X gets my IP? Um, does that does that change the fact that my kid is, you know, going to have some breakfast or that I'm going to? If not, it's not going to resonate as much as uh, an emotional, a, a emotional plea to the self, whether that's being fear or uh, a fear or a positive emotion. So to make the point, um, I had a better transition for this in the past, but, you know, look at these images here. If any of them elicit a response, it's the one on the left or the one on the right. Right, uh, and there's a reason for that. Those things have been in our environment for a long time. That guy in the middle, I know we all put little protective things on it, um, yet I haven't met too many people that actually A, try to stick a fork in it, uh, but I certainly haven't met anybody who's ever just been afraid by virtue of walking upon one. Uh, and I think that speaks a little bit about how the, the human brain has, has been operated up to, up to today. So I'm gonna speak briefly about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, for you, those remember this from you know psychology 101. Uh, everyone has these um, these lower rungs: physiological, safety, social support, support uh, that a human being needs to kind of own uh, before they can move to the next level. Right? It's hard for me to think about uh, my social, my larger social context, or the need to to assist the community when I don't have food in in my stomach, uh, when I'm constantly under stress. Um, when, uh, you know, when there are uh, attackers in my environment. As we move up these rings, rungs, it frees us to uh, think about more. Um, at the top of that pyramid is supposedly self-actualization. I heard some other interesting arguments about that from an individualistic versus a uh, cooperative-based society. But at the end of the day, um, most of us are right around those lower three rungs, I think, at any given day. You know, and then there's also this, also this. I think that's that's the immediate is, is internet connectivity to to bring it to today's. Um, and uh, and the folks who are targeting us from an advertising uh, perspective knows that as well. Um, social engineers know this as well, and they'll leverage these. 
So why do people why do people do dumb things uh, when it comes to security? Whether that's falling for a phishing email um, or any type of social engineering engagement, um, or just violating a security rule on their own. On one hand, there's just general well-being, right? If you're sick, if you're stressed, uh, it's hard to pay attention to more than that. Uh, and that's been one of those major elements that's been raised again and again as, as, a, as a main uh, factor at play. Uh, environmental, if your environment is horrible, then you're probably not gonna do too well. You can think about that in different, uh, multiple ways, right? We all have that office with the humming fluorescent light overhead and you know, gets in your head and it starts bothering you. And, that's taking away from your attention on the task in front of you. Um, so you might be more prone to make errors. Cognitive failures are limits, um, just our own ability, what we've been trained on. Evolutionary learned uh, biases that we carry into an environment. Um, perceived authority and fear, uh, always an excellent, an excellent way to uh, get people to not report something uh, when they see a violation is that uh, the social uh, mechanism overrides that. I may understand that my organization says that I have to report X, Y, Z, uh, but when my job is at risk, then maybe I'm not going to, right? Um, uh, using, those, using those elements, authority and fear against the individual's uh, tendency to report because it's a threat to oneself to report potentially because of repercussions. Established norms, shadow cultures, of course, uh, disparity of rules are all, all come into play. Uh, and these are all things that our brains pay attention to. And then lastly, knowledge base. Um, so a little bit on building on what works. Um, I, I would say on one hand, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, this is something that I've had some conversations with my coworkers around uh, and talking about cybersecurity with folks. But you know, in general, um, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, when uh, expressed to a person, they don't create, make a person want to do a thing, right? They make you want to stop doing a thing. Um, Fear, uncertainty, and doubt are great ways to get people to uh, not act a certain way, but it's hard to make them be proactive towards security. It doesn't make, change people into reporting, uh, it just makes them shut down. Uh, representation, um, do we have models in our organizations where, you know, in terms of software development life cycles, we bring in people to beta test uh, who are gonna be our actual users. Do we bring in that representation into building our, our policies and procedures? Um, anyone who has kids, I have two who are being amazingly quiet right now, and I can't believe it. Um, having having some buy-in where I provide them options about what the rules are going to look like uh, that I decide, um, it, it enhances the chance that they're going to actually abide by those rules, um, and that can be a, a useful changer in, in the organization. Enforcement and adherence. Um, if we're not uh, enforcing the rules across the board the same way, then very quickly the word gets out that the rules don't mean anything. Uh, we've all seen that take place. Uh, and then rewarding. Uh, rewarding, rewarding, and rewarding. Positive reinforcement uh, does a lot more in terms of getting people to do what you want them to do. Uh, transparency and then deltas and security culture. I think that kind of makes sense, right? Um, if your C-level is, is acting one way, um, you know, and your your lower levels are acting another. That doesn't that doesn't help uh, maintain a security posture. So something that I've seen that's been really useful is actually obtaining atmospherics. And by what that I mean, I don't I'm not just talking about sending out a survey monkey to your employees or uh, in an organization and saying how do you feel about things, but you know, looking at what's actually working in one part of an organization versus another in terms of adherence to rules. Um, proactive participation rules. What is it that you want to measure is definitely something you have to look at up front. Um, but identifying what's working where and why, and then if you find that you have deltas in one place or another, applying maybe some of those across the organization and seeing what you can do. Um, are there any deltas between you know, executive and staff pers uh, perspectives? Is there any way that we can, uh, from looking at enhancing our security culture, is there any kind of metrics that we can do? What can we build into a system? Maybe it's not just the click-through rate, but maybe it's the report rate. Uh, maybe it's the pass it on. I've, certainly, I'm sure none of us have ever seen that where, um, where you've been working on engagement and you fish somebody and then they actually send your phishing email to others. Um, that might be something you want to track as well, right? Both sides of it, more than just a single click. 
So uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. You know, how do we provide it out? And I think this is one of the most important things is at the end of the day, social engineering, uh, it, it preys on the way the human mind operates, right? Uh, and anyone who's good at it can, can figure those things out. So how do we provide a way for individuals to get out of a situation that Terry? Uh, when I was in the intelligence world, uh, I came across something that I thought was fascinating, and I don't think it exists yet, and I've been out for some time, uh, called Noir. And the idea was it was a National Office of Intelligence Re uh, Reconciliation. And the idea was this, was that when a spy got into the espionage cycle, right, um, so they have either been recruited uh, by a hostile uh, intelligence agency, nation state, or maybe they just did it themselves, right? They just decided to go into it and started spying. Um, there was no way out of the cycle. Um, once, you're, once they're in it, they're pretty much done. Um, and their screws might have been tightened on by a third party or what have you, but generally there was no way out. So what uh, Dr. David Charney was was provided, was suggesting was that there was some sort of body through which an individual who was caught in the loop could self pull themselves out uh, with the understanding that they had some top cover, right? Because it was more value to the intelligence community uh, at large and national security to uh, actually understand the mechanics of what was going on rather than spending uh, a bunch of time and a bunch of analyst work on a counterintelligence thing, trying to figure out what the problem was, trying to figure out who the offenders were, right? Um, it saves time and energy and, and perhaps averse a catastrophe as well and loss of life. I take that and say, you know, for our smaller organizations, um, is there a way that we can create these kinds of ways out of a situation, right? Um, where, you know, you, you, you knocked over the glass of milk, uh, rather than running and hiding, uh, rather than hiding the mess, uh, uh, you know, is there a way that we can be uh, full upfront about it, and that we can get people to be proactive and, and have that discussion? Um, because once the, the flip side of it is, you know, once employees and members start learning that uh, not only will not reporting uh, not be a problem, but hiding uh, issues uh, will all, they'll also get away with. That's a learned behavior, and that's really dangerous to our overall. Uh, security and posture as well, uh, learning bad lessons, so to say. So I packed a lot in there. I know I can do some of in a couple hours, but um, thank you for everyone for your time today. Uh, with that, if there's there's any questions at the time we have left. Yeah, thanks so much for, for that presentation. Um, I don't see any questions in um, in the, the Discord channel yet. Um, Mary Moore, I did have a, a comment about the human timeline, about humans making art since 25,000 uh, 25, to 30,000 BC. About and, making art? Yeah. And new I evidence shows like that recently that's, that they've changed the numbers on that significantly. Um, yeah, it's it's all up to, and you know, what, what is artwork, right? Yeah. 